coronavirus pandemic. The White House reveals a plan to distribute masks across the country. COVID relief, where the American Rescue Plan stands in Congress and how it could affect you. Caring for others, how a program in Hungary is helping persecuted Christians and offering humanitarian assistance. And stamp of approval. Check out the new pictures featured on the postage unveiled by the Vatican. On EWTN News Nightly for Wednesday, February 24th, 2021. Thank you so much for being with us tonight. I'm Tracy Sable. The White House announces a plan to send millions of free masks to people who can't afford them and rely less on other countries for essential items. Advisors also say they are getting ready to ship millions of doses of a new vaccine. However, a moral dilemma over the shots could raise concerns for pro-lifers. White House correspondent Owen Jensen reports. Owen. Tracy, good evening to you. Tonight, the White House wants to fight the coronavirus pandemic by making sure more children and adults have access to well-fitting cloth masks. This, as another vaccine, moves a step closer to approval. President Biden is clear. We are at war with this virus. The COVID-19 response team, with equity in mind, announces free masks on the way. More than 25 million going to low-income, vulnerable Americans who've taken the brunt of the coronavirus. Any American who needs a mask will be able to walk into these health centers or food pantries and pick up high-quality, American-made masks. Meanwhile, the new Johnson & Johnson vaccine, closer to emergency use authorization. If an EUA is issued, we anticipate allocating three to four million doses of Johnson & Johnson vaccine next week. The vaccine, regulators say, provides strong protection against severe COVID-19. But pro-life groups warn it's made from an abortion-derived cell line. U.S. Catholic bishops say morally compromised vaccines should be avoided if there are alternatives available, adding, we should be on guard so that the new COVID-19 vaccines do not desensitize us or weaken our determination to oppose the evil of abortion itself. Meanwhile, supply chains and national security. President Joe Biden met with lawmakers today before signing an executive order aimed at reviewing the U.S. supply chain. At a news briefing, the president's economic team warning. America should never face shortages of critical products in times of crisis. Our supply chain should not be vulnerable to manipulation by competitor nations. Also tonight, after using their initial allotments, both CVS and Walgreens have received more vaccine doses. And starting tomorrow, they'll put more shots in more arms across more states. At the White House, Owen Jensen, EWTN News Nightly. On Capitol Hill, Democrats in the House are on track to pass their COVID relief bill on Friday. House Majority Leader Steny Hoyer says he is confident that he can hold his caucus together, but Republicans are firing back. Capitol Hill correspondent Eric Rosales reports. Eric. Well, Tracy, over the last few days, Republicans in both the House and the Senate have been gathering together discussing the $1.9 trillion COVID relief bill. Now, Republicans say if passed, according to the Congressional Budget Office, 1.4 million jobs could be lost. That's because of the $15 minimum wage increase that would go into effect across the country. Democrats remain committed to working with our colleagues from the other side of the aisle to improve the bill. But at the end of the day, the American people sent us here with a job to do, and the clock is ticking. Democrats on the Hill say that they will not wait to move forward with the American Rescue Plan. It's our hope that some of my colleagues on the other side of the aisle will stop playing politics. Pelosi, Schumer, and Biden decided to use a pandemic to push forward a progressive wish list items uh, to reward political allies, friends, and donors at the expense of the American working class. Besides a federal minimum wage of $15 per hour, Republicans say $270 million goes to art and humanities endowments, $200 million for museums and libraries, $50 million in so-called family planning funding, and that's not all. $100 million for a tunnel in Silicon Valley just outside of Speaker Pelosi's district. 
or a bridge for Schumer. Louisiana Senator John Kennedy tells me the mantra of Democrats is it's impossible to spend too much. He says deficits do matter. And when you break down the spending, 9% is only about direct COVID relief. The spending porn in this bill is breathtaking. Uh, they, they, uh, it promotes abortion. It's not a coronavirus bill. It's a liberal wish list. Right now, Republicans and Democrats are waiting to find out if the $15 minimum wage increase can even be put into the bill. Because it is a budgetary item, it may have to be put into a separate bill. If it doesn't pass and get into this bill, progressive Democrats like Bernie Sanders say that they're already working on Plan B. At the Capitol, Eric Rosales, EWTN News Nightly. Well, joining us now is Tim Carney, political columnist for the Washington Examiner and resident fellow at the American Enterprise Institute. Tim, welcome back. Always good to see you. Uh, so as we just heard, Senator Kennedy is calling the American Rescue Plan a liberal wish list. What do you think? Well, the, the biggest hang up is the minimum wage increase because this is supposed to be a budget bill. In fact, it's getting special treatment in the Senate, avoiding the filibuster because it's under what they call budget reconciliation rules. And so while there are going to be Republican objections to stuff like the family planning uh, money for abortion providers and the earmarks for Pelosi's district, the place where they uh, the Republicans actually have leverage might be on the attempt to increase the minimum wage, which is not really a budgetary item. That's a mandate on businesses. Tim, let's talk a little bit more about this bill. You know, what do you like? What do you dislike about it? And ultimately, do you think it will pass? I, I think that without the minimum wage hike, it will pass. That Democrats have 50 seats, and then Kamala Harris, the vice president, gets to pass the tie-breaking votes. And where the objecting Democrats, that's uh, Senator Kirsten Sinema of Arizona, Joe Manchin of West Virginia, they really have all the cards, and where they're objecting is on the minimum wage. They don't really have any objections to the earmarks or to the family planning money. So I think by pulling the minimum wage, they'll get it across. I think a $1,400 check to Americans is a fine thing. What I would have liked to see, though, is more money to prop up the businesses that are being shut down by government. Your local pub, your local coffee shop, your local small bookstore that can't be open if your county or city is, is forcing them to shut down. The money last year was sent through stuff like the Paycheck, Paycheck Protection Program to keep them open. There's not really enough parallel to that in this bill. All right, I want to switch gears just a little bit here. Uh, two hearings that were scheduled to vote on uh, Neera Tannen's nomination to be the director of the Office of Management and Budget were unexpectedly postponed today. Uh, I want to get your thoughts on that and what you think it means for her nomination. Her nomination's in huge trouble. I mean, what's what's happening is that, again, you've got Joe Manchin opposing it. You've got Kirsten Sinema's on one of the committees who might uh, who has a, a authority over this. She might oppose it. And the sort of moderate Republicans that Democrats were hoping to get, um, none of them are on board. And so, to some extent, there's there's an interesting politics that goes on here. She might have been always sort of a sacrificial lamb. The, the Democrats are getting a lot of fun out of saying, Republicans are opposing her because she's a woman of color. That is the main line. Now, the Republicans' objections to her are on, on many scores. Whether or not she's qualified, uh, her history of attacking people on Twitter is, is front and center in all of this. And so it seems to me that it's possible Joe Biden knew she had a good chance of getting defeated, but still wanted the fight, in part because it provides cover for Xavier Becerra. He's also going through as a nominee to be the Secretary of Health and Human Services. He has a long record of uh, oppressing pro-lifers in, in one way or another. And now all the media attention and Republican attention is fired on near a tandem. That could help Becerra avoid some of that fire. Okay, Tim, we're going to leave it right there. Thank you so much for your analysis. We always appreciate it. Tim Carney, political columnist for the Washington Examiner and resident fellow at the American Enterprise Institute. Thanks again. Thank you. Well, Pope Francis has a new doctor after the loss of his previous one last month due to COVID-19 complications. 
Dr. Roberto Bernabe is a professor at a Catholic university in Rome and is a specialist in aging. This appointment comes after the Holy Father has experienced a number of back pain episodes due to sciatica. The Hungarian government is pledging to help persecuted Christians around the world. Hungary Helps is a nonprofit organization run by the Hungarian government. For the past five years, it has provided help in Africa and the Middle East. Last November, the country lit popular monuments in red to raise awareness of the millions of Christians persecuted each year. Joining us now from Budapest is Tristan Osbe, State Secretary for the Aid of Persecuted Christians and the Hungry Helps Program. Tristan, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, tell us, how is your organization helping persecuted Christians around the world and especially in the Middle East? Thank you for having me and inviting me. The Hungry Helps Program is Hungary's humanitarian aid program. It has started in uh, 2017. Hungary is an emerging donor country when it comes to humanitarian assistance. And there is one very unique feature about our national humanitarian assistance program is that we have set uh, one of our major uh, priorities to support persecuted Christian communities and other persecuted religious uh, minorities all around the world with humanitarian assistance. We focus on persecuted Christians, but not uh, exclusively. Uh, we are providing aid to these uh, religious uh, groups. What has been the reaction to the Hungarian government's focus on persecuted Christians? Hungary is setting one of its humanitarian programs geared towards supporting persecuted Christians has a message. Of course, there are uh, critiques of our program. Uh, some uh, people misunderstand it or uh, deliberately misunderstand it as a program that only supports Christians, which is, which is not true. Even if we work with uh, Christian uh, groups and uh, churches uh, like uh, what we do in the Middle East at several uh, instances and, and uh, locations. Whenever we support a Christian institution, it has to benefit all the other uh, people uh, from different faith groups and communities. This is how we enable the Christian communities to extend a, help, a helping hand uh, to their compatriots belonging to uh, other faith uh, groups or even to the majority groups. This is how we promote peaceful coexistence through our support. And of course, uh, there are the anti-Christian, uh, usually political movements who would like to deny uh, the fact that Christianity is a persecuted religious group. They would like to portray uh, Christianity and Christians as an aggressive uh, group that is, uh, that is uh, discriminating against uh, other people into their false uh, anti-Christian narrative. The truth will not fit, and the truth is that uh, Christians are persecuted in many places in the world, and uh, they deserve assistance and, and uh, all the support that we can give them from the West. And quickly, uh, before I let you go, how do you think the Holy Father's trip to Iraq will help persecuted Christians in that region? I think that it will be a, a visit of historical importance. Whenever I visit the persecuted Christians of uh, Iraq, they told me that they have suffered tremendous uh, losses. They have uh, suffered uh, a genocide. They have lost their uh, loved ones and their, their homes. But what is uh, the greatest uh, grief in the situation is that they have uh, felt abandoned. They have felt that the so-called Christian West didn't come uh, to their assistance. Well, Tristan, thank you so much for your time today and for what you do. We appreciate it. Tristan Osbe. State Secretary for the Aid of Persecuted Christians and the Hungry Helps Program. Thank you again. Thank you very much. Coming up, school controversy. How political opinions could creep into education and change the message delivered to students. House of Representatives is set to take up a vote this week on the Equality Act. It would ban discrimination against people based on their sexual orientation and gender identity. President Biden supports the bill, writing in a statement last week in part, quote, the Equality Act provides long overdue federal civil rights protections on the basis of sexual orientation and gender identity. 
locking in critical safeguards in our housing, education, public services, and lending systems, and codifying the courage and resilience of the LGBTQ plus movement into enduring law. Joining us now is Emily Gow, director of the DeVos Center for Religion and Civil Society at the Heritage Foundation. Emily, welcome. Thank you so much for being here now. Uh, first off, I want to get your take on the Equality Act. What concerns do you have about it, in particular, when it comes to our children and their education? Well, thank you so much. Some of our concerns about children revolve around the politicization of education. One of the main things that we are hearing um, from parents around the country is that they don't want their children to be taught this destructive gender ideology. But that is exactly what the Equality Act could lead to in all 50 states. Because the Equality Act addresses the 1964 Civil Rights Act and modifies it, the Civil Rights Act of 1964 led to federal courts um, directing schools to adopt black history curriculum. The same thing could happen if the Equality Act were to pass. Federal courts could say to schools that they have to adopt curriculum with this destructive gender ideology and a politicized viewpoint about sexual orientation. And that would be very dangerous for children across the country. Well, I know the Heritage Foundation is part of an initiative called the Promise to America's Children. Tell us more about that and its purpose. Yes, the Promise to America's Children is a nationwide movement of parents and lawmakers who are coming together to protect children's minds, bodies, and their relationships with their families. The Promise lays out 10 principles of how children can be protected from the sexualization that we see in our culture, but also the sexualization that we see coming from laws and policies like the Equality Act. And it has received tremendous support from parents across the country. Lawmakers are endorsing it. And lawmakers are also introducing good bills to protect children. And that's one of the things that the promise highlights. I know uh, the group mentions on the website that school curriculum is filled with graphic information about things like abortion, sex, and gender identity. Can you talk more about that and what you think will happen uh, if the Equality Act is passed? So I think a lot of parents are waking up to the problem that is happening in our schools with comprehensive sexuality education that promotes abortion, that introduces graphic information about sex, that promotes consent to children who cannot consent to sex, and that promotes gender ideology and sexual orientation. And parents are not okay with this. They want to stand up against it, and they are fighting it at the state and local level. But as I said, the Federal Equality Act could override all of those efforts. And that's why parents are joining on to the promise. And Emily, we have about a minute left, but quickly, uh, tell us what Promise to America's Children, you know, is doing really to protect children and what we as parents can do as well. So the Promise is uniting parents and lawmakers. We're providing information to parents about how they can fight back at every level, whether it's the local school board or it's the state legislature or it's Congress. And we're also working with lawmakers to help highlight the good bills that they are enacting that hopefully will pass that protect children's minds, bodies, and relationships with their parents. Well, Emily, thank you so much for joining us today. We really appreciate it. Emily Gal with the Heritage Foundation. Thank you again. Thank you. Up next, cause for canonization. The push to get the Vatican to recognize the first African-American priest. And postage pictures. The Holy See unveils a new look for its stamps. About 10 years ago today, the Sainthood Calls was opened for the first African-American Catholic priest. Father Augustus Tolton was born into slavery back in the 1850s. He overcame abject poverty, the death of his father, and even being denied acceptance by every Catholic seminary in the United States to become a Catholic priest. In 2019, Father Tolton was declared venerable 
by Pope Francis. And joining us now is Deacon Harold Burke Sivers, co-host of EWTN's God's Blueprint for a Happy Life and author of Father Augustus Tolton, The Slave Who Became the First African-American Priest, a book published by EWTN. Deacon Harold, great to see you. Thank you so much for coming on. Uh, can you update us on where the canonization process for Father Tolton stands right now? Yeah, as far as the process, it's actually moving pretty quickly uh, for sainthood causes. He is now a uh, venerable Augustus Tolton, and so he just needs a miracle to become blessed and then a second miracle to become a saint. So it's uh, moving along quite nicely. That is wonderful. Tell us a little bit more about him and, and what inspired you to write the book. And, and also, you know, did it impact your faith? Yeah, absolutely. When I was in seventh grade, uh, that's when confirmations were held in the Archdiocese of Newark, where I, where I grew up. And I went to the library to find a saint that looked like me. And so I was looking, I accidentally came across Sister Carolyn Hemisat's book, From Slave to Priest, which is the biography of Augustus Tolton. I'd never heard of him before. So I said, wow, that, so that kind of piqued my interest. And so when Ignatius Press bought the rights to Sister Hemisat's book and republished it in 2005, they asked me to write the new forward to the book and also to, um, to help publicize it. So, uh, the, the, you know, say, uh, about Augustus Tolton, which I was more than happy to do. It reacquainted me with this amazing saint and, uh, and, and really inspired me to write the book, which is lessons we can learn from his life that we can apply to our everyday lived experience today. That is wonderful. Well, what message uh, do you think his witness sends to the faithful, especially as we celebrate Black History Month? Well, what's, what's interesting is you, sometimes you hear people say, well, why do you belong to the white church? You know that the Catholic church is the white church. But see, what's striking to me about Father Augustus Tolton is why he stayed in the Catholic church. He put up with incredible prejudice and racial animosity, and yet he stayed. Why? In the face of such bigotry and hatred, he recognized that what the church teaches as a spotless bride of Christ is true and good and beautiful, despite the people in the church who are all in need of God's mercy, who are sinners, and who don't live up to the, to the creed and to the tenets that they actually profess about the faith. And in that way, to me, he's an inspiration. Absolutely. You can hear uh, one last question. Tell us about your new show. I want to hear all about it. Yes. Yeah, so uh, Father Brian Milady and I have teamed up once again. We This is our fifth series together for EWTM, and it's called God, God's Blueprint for a Happy Life. And we basically go through the Ten Commandments, uh, and we explore those Ten Commandments and break them open now for a new era, for our day today, and, and, and mind the riches of God's uh, articulation of the natural law to see how we can apply that to our life today, especially given uh, everything that's happening in the culture and how we can work against that by cooperating with the grace of the sacraments and the natural moral law in the Ten Commandments. That is wonderful. Perfect timing for it, too. Well, Deacon Harold, thank you so much for coming on. It was great talking to you. We appreciate it. Always great to be with you. Thank you for having me. And finally tonight, the Vatican has released this year's postage stamp designs. One of the stamps was designed for Easter, featuring a painting of the risen Lord who appeared to the 12 apostles to calm their fears. Another one celebrates the year of St. Joseph, and another stamp remembers the Holy Father's trip to Abu Dhabi. We thank you for watching tonight. For the entire EWTF News Nightly team, I'm Tracy Sable. Good night and God bless.